Today we visited Great Sand Dunes National Park to get our eyes stung by flying sand, abandon an attempt to drive to a waterfall, and drive higher into the thrilling Rocky Mountains and to the highest city in the United States. Morning came to Valley Haven Lodge and we got to see Center Colorado in the sun for the first time. I took care of the laundry, all by myself with no help. Whatever, whatever. And anyway, during breakfast, the lady from last night asked if her sick family members had kept us awake overnight. We just said, no, we slept fine. I said one last goodbye to the clothespin that was in our room and had my name etched on it. I swear I didn't do this. And we drove through center to the Great Sand Dunes, about half an hour away. Today's forecast was wind. There are only about 1,900 people in center, and farming seems to be the main thing here. I tried to get a ground-level perspective on all those circles from the satellite view. On County Lane 6, something happened that was every bit as exciting as the first roadrunner we saw in Arizona way back on day 11. A tumbleweed rolled by in front of the car. The legends are true, they do exist. And we had to pull over for the views towards the great sand dunes. Colorado always offers great photo opportunities with different colors and textures all within one scene. In this case, from the snow-topped Sangre de Cristo Mountains to the soft brown dunes with cloud shadows, to the yellow and green fields below. Pelted with tumbleweeds, which by the way grow like normal plants but then separate and blow around in the wind to scatter their seeds, we entered Great Sand Dunes, which is a national park right next to a nature preserve. It was a national monument in 1932 and became a national park in 2004. The visitor center had some nice displays explaining the dunes, which was good because, to be honest, I found the brochure lacking in details, which is a shame because the story here is quite unique. What happens is, sand was created in these, the San Juan Mountains, on the other side of center. Strong southwest winds blew it into a large lake that used to be here in the valley. The water from that lake, incidentally, went into the Rio Grande River and formed the Rio Grande Gorge down in Taos. But anyway, that ancient lake receded about 440,000 years ago, and the wind started blowing the exposed sand toward the giant Sangre de Cristo Mountains into this little corner. But northeastern winds blow through three mountain passes the other way, and the opposing forces cause the sand to build up vertically. Two seasonal creeks run around the dune field when snow melts in the spring, carrying some of the sand back to the southwest where the process keeps repeating. The end result is the highest dunes in North America. Interestingly, and I wish the brochure explained this, the biggest dunes can last for a long, long time. A ranger in the visitor center, who seemed uninterested like he was having a bad day, warned us about the wind on the dunes today. Despite all that, there were lots of people here, including several school buses and lots of kids running around. And since this was May, Medano Creek was full of ice-cold water from melted snow, and you have to walk through it to climb the dunes. There was no time to notice your freezing toes, though. All your attention goes to the fiercely blowing sand. It's not always like this, but I thought it was cool. Wind is vital here, after all.
It's not a road trip until you do some barefoot driving with muddy feet. We wanted to see nearby Zapata Falls outside the park boundary, but immediately gave up. The unpaved road was so rough that going was real slow in our little Toyota. And along with this trip's rules, like no interstate and always go the actual speed limit, keeping the gas tank up is another one. I haven't even seen the low gas indicator in this entire trip, but we were getting low now and I wasn't sure we'd make it to the waterfall and back to the gas station. So much for Zapata Falls. Back around center, we got a look at what those southwest winds can do to the landscape. I knew we were heading further into the high Rocky Mountains, but you couldn't see them from down here in the valley. This was more like Missouri back on day 42. But then there they were. And while we climbed through towns deeper in central Colorado, we pulled over at Puncha Pass for an in-car picnic. This is one of Colorado's lowest mountain passes, but I found the view thrilling. This is really my type of landscape. Pancha Pass is a collection of crossroads. It's the border between the Sangre de Cristo Mountains and the Sawatch Mountains, Sawatch and Chafee Counties, and the San Luis Valley, where we just came from, and the Arkansas River Valley ahead. Remember when I promised we'd see the Arkansas River again when we crossed it back on day 43 in Arkansas? Well, it starts near here and, as I understand it, is pronounced Arkansas in these parts. And Colorado continued to reveal its unique landscapes. I had to pull over to take this photo of four distinct looking ridges in succession ahead. Wow! Train tracks between Highway 285 and the Arkansas, uh, the Arkansas River remind you that a lot of the towns we're passing through were founded by the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad in the 1800s. But our home for the night was founded not by trains, but thanks to gold and especially silver mining. We were staying at a functional hotel on the south side of town. The view from my room was to some 14,000 foot peaks, which I loved, although we might not have been the most gracious guests. But Leadville should be used to the rougher side of life. In the 1880s, it was infamous for being almost ungovernable. City marshals, themselves sometimes lawless, would be killed or run out of town before things gradually got calmer. Several notable historical figures had ties to Leadville, including Doc Holliday, the unsinkable Molly Brown, and, ever fearless, Oscar Wilde, who gave a lecture in the violent hardscrabble town about the aesthetic importance of art for art's sake. To be honest, I was feeling a bit queasy, maybe from the altitude. Leadville, as it turns out, is the highest elevation city in the United States. So dinner was in the room where I could relax, and where after some research we realized that our next destination, Rocky Mountain National Park to the north, was still mostly closed due to snow and probably wouldn't be worth seeing right now. So we made other plans for the next few days, which are going to be a constant rush of famous parks, amazing monuments, and riveting drives. And we bundled up for the night because the weather forecast was for temperatures right at freezing by the morning. That's how it goes way up here in Silver Country. Tomorrow, the roads get higher, the snow gets deeper, and we end up at the seldom visited north rim of the national park with the most awesome name of them all, Black Canyon of the Gunnison.